Hi, everyone, and welcome to an all new episode of Got Mental Health. In today's episode, we speak with the fabulous Molly Burney. She is a therapist turned coach. In this episode, we talk about the differences between therapy and coaching and the benefits of both. We discuss the pros and cons of psychedelic treatment, and we also discuss the importance of having supervision as a mental health professional. I hope you enjoy the episode. Thanks so much. Welcome back, everyone, to the Got Mental Health Podcast. I am your co-host, Rachel Cove, along with my other co-host, Martha Mogolewski. Arthur Mogolewski. Let's <laughs> get it straight. Hi, Martha. Hey, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> We have the wonderful, amazing Molly Burney in the house today. Molly is a clinical life coach in private practice. She works with high achieving professionals seeking efficient, authentic transitions and behavioral change. Her coaching style has been described as compassionate straight talk with therapeutic roots and draws upon her years as a therapist in a variety of treatment environments, as a private consultant and interventionist for families in crisis. These clinical underpinnings are now the foundation of her work as a personal coach for folks looking for a clearer understanding of the mechanics of their mind. She holds a master's in clinical psychology from Antioch University with a specialization in addiction studies. Welcome to the podcast, Molly. Welcome, welcome. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. So the first thing I want to say for all listeners right now, I want you to go to your Instagram and I want you to type in Molly Burney because... Your Instagram to this day is one of my favorite Instagrams to go to for straight talk for a passionate mother, clinical psychologist or clinical therapist who's now turned coach. But the information that you put out there, Molly, it's like no bullshit. Thank you. That's why I, I couldn't have asked for for a, um, a more delicious setup. Thank you. That's um, that's that's pretty much the brand, um, and part of why I've you know pivoted. I know we'll get into this uh, the pivot from uh, therapist to coach, but um, I, and not that you can't be a therapist and have no bullshit be the brand, but I didn't want to have any noise about is it okay to do this? Is it okay to speak this way? Is it okay to show up this way? Um, is it okay if the, if it's the appropriate intervention with the appropriate client to say? Do you know you're occurring like an asshole right now? And can we get curious about where else that's happening? And and, and let's get interested in this. Um, so I'm I'm really glad that it shows up that way because I there's no other way I I could be. I think. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah, and I, I really want to start it off with you were a therapist and you transitioned <laughs> into becoming a coach. So can you tell us a little bit of that story? Sure. Uh, well, I've been working with my coach uh, since I was in my early 20s. And I I, I started off in my early 20s. I was a choral conductor. I was finishing a master's in conducting, of all things. Um, and my coach had said to me, Molly, are you done pretending to be a conductor? You're ready to coach. And I was like, what? I'm sorry. I'm busy with a conducting career. What are you talking about? Um, and after enough nudging, I, I finally said, look, I, I understand it. I, I'm not a phenomenal conductor. You're, you're guiding me in the direction of human behavior. But I can't coach. Coaches are coaches are assholes. Coaches are unlicensed. There's no credibility in that field. I can't go in that direction. I'm saying this to my coach, by the way, who is listening. Like, what do you think I am? Um, <laughs> but I, I said, look, I, I can I can go be a therapist. I need the I want the credentialing. I want the licensure. I want the credibility, and I, I want the clinical training. If I'm going to be involved in offering advice and perspective, I, I want to know that I have something to speak from. Um, so I did that. I, I did that for um, for a few years. I got the master's. I, I got the hours towards licensure and did the therapist thing for a bit. And finally, my coach said again, are you done pretending to be a therapist? Are you ready to be a coach? And at that point, having felt what it felt like to be working with clients and tugging my own reins and wanting to speak a little bit more freely um, and wanting to share, frankly, more of myself where appropriate. I, I wanted there to be uh, more more agency for self-disclosure where that could be a contribution. Um, eventually, I said, all right, to my coach, try me. I'm here. I'm ready to go. So I didn't go through a, um, a, a credentialing coaching process. I went through the old school apprentice style. I, I sat at, in all of his groups and trained that way and, and ran my cases with him. And um, the rest is history. Is it the right approach? <laughs> I have so many questions. I know. Because, you know, we employ a lot of therapists and, and coaches and kind of the vast of both. And, uh, you know, 
we could get into the licensure and the regulations and the and the and the scrutiny behind all of that uh, with the states. But do you feel like it's beneficial for a life coach to be a therapist first, or to jump in straight as a life coach? Because you have both fields happening, right? So you have therapists who don't want to be limited or regulated. They want to mm -hmm. be able to be expressive and and kind of you know, the quote unquote, no bullshit talk. Um, mm -hmm. And then they, they trans they translate into a, a coach. And then you have just individuals who don't have any therapeutic background, but they want to become mm -hmm. a life coach. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> oh, I have all two different sorts people. of thoughts on yeah. that. Yes, of course. Um, but, I, but I also think there's some nuance and some gray area. So like, do I think that any 22 year old falling out of college deciding I want to take a two week course and go be a life coach should do that? No, I have serious concerns about that person coaching anybody because part of what qualifies a coach is your own life experience. Um, that's one of the big distinctions between therapy and coaching. That as a therapist, we're drawing on clinical experience and clinically honed knowledge. Um, but as a coach, I'm sharing from a body of personal experience. And that means I need enough successes, enough failures, enough pivots, enough transitions, enough blood on the field right. so that I can speak to these experiences. Um, and it, I don't, so I don't think it's the therapy background that qualifies me to coach, although that certainly helps. I want to be very clear about that. That certainly helps. Um, but I think the, the life experience is really what qualifies the coach and the ability to translate that. And that's where I think the therapeutic background helps is that understanding what you're listening for, how to speak in a way that someone else can listen, right. um, and really what you're looking for in terms of the, the patterns you're offering feedback on. So uh, it certainly, I think it's helpful to have a therapeutic background and I'm very, I'm appropriately cautious about coaches that don't have any training, but I, I do think that, um, just because you don't have training doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have something to say as a coach. So I think there's a lot of gray area. Yeah, it's interesting because for the longest time, I'm so technically I have a credential as a certified life coach, certified recovery coach. That was my mm -hmm. that's my credential now. But before I never had a credential and the feedback I was getting from I would run family groups. This was years ago at different types of centers. And I would have trained therapists come into my family groups to try to take notes on how I was conducting the group because I was so effective. And the clients would say to me, why do I get more from you in three sessions than a lifetime of work in therapy? And I'm not saying that to boost my ego. It's just to say like, it is possible to be a good coach and to not have actual one-on-one -on -one training. And also the other side of it is there's a lot of coaches that shouldn't be coaches and have no experience. And so, you know, in regards to your experience working as a therapist and as a coach, mm -hmm. what do you see are the two main differences? Mm, the, to me, the biggest difference is that as a therapist, my focus in the conversation was to heal. So that was, and this is a little bit reductive, but um, broadly speaking, that was the goal with the client is to facilitate healing. So any thought that goes through my head, anything I want to say to the client, I'm assessing, is this in service of their healing or not? With coaching, the game is about disruption. Healing is not the priority so much. I am looking to disrupt. But here's where the art form comes in, is that for some clients, that disruption is healing. And for some clients, that healing is disruptive. So it really depends who you're speaking to, what you're bringing to the conversation, and, and what you're working with. Because there are some clients who the version of disruption they actually need in front of me is more of a therapeutic conversation. And there are some clients who need a little bit more healing or need the disruption because you're looking to interrupt patterns and intervene on things. Um, and that disruption can have a healing quality to it. So I, I certainly don't market what I what I do as uh, as a hybrid of therapy and coaching, but it definitely draws on both. But those are the big distinctions to, from healing to disruption. Is that dealing with the question? Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I. I. Uh, and the. It's again. It goes back and forth and teeter tottering. And if I'm a client, <clears throat> I'm playing devil's advocate. When I'm looking up a therapist, when I'm looking up. Um, somebody to work with it to, to disrupt my patterns to really change my behavior and the way that I look at things right the one security that I have is in knowing 
point blank is the license, right? Without mm-hmm. knowing the actual therapist, because nobody knows the therapist, okay? I, mm-hmm. I've gone to therapy, I've tried a bunch of, you know, for lack of a better word, not so great therapists, and, you know, mm-hmm. until I find the one that I was like, okay, well, yeah, this guy's good, uh, or gal's good, right? And so that licensure, though, gives some sense of security that, okay, I'm at least in some form of a helping hand that's safe, and it's not going to disrupt my life in a bad way, right? Whatever that inherent thing does for you, right? As a coach, I agree with you 100%. I'm not licensed by any capacity, but I can sit down with a client and completely shift their train of thought within 10 minutes of having a conversation with them. I'm not a life coach either. I'm just I'm just saying that I, I know how to get to people. I know how to talk to people, and I know how to listen to people. You're my life coach. Well, you know. Uh how does How's it going, one, Rachel? He's fucking phenomenal. I tell him that all the time. How does all one? Right. How does one kn- have that safe? Like you talked about your experience, and I agree with you ten thousand percent. But if someone doesn't know you, how do they have that sense of security that, like, you know what, this person will give me what I'm looking for? I don't think you can, nor do I think you should. I don't want my clients to feel secure and totally safe with me. Look, this is a safe space from this, you know, this Zoom room. Yeah. Um, you know, when a client comes in to see me, yeah, this is safe in the sense that um, I'm not here. Uh, I, I'm here entirely in service of your development and evolution. But that doesn't mean that that's not going to be painful, potentially, or in um, or frustrating or confusing or appropriately disruptive. Um, but I'm, I guess I'm not too worried about is someone trusting me to give them the answer. If, if they're coming to see me and they're paying my fee, but they're still going, yeah, I don't totally trust you. That's not a me problem. Mm. That's, that's up to them to ask more questions yeah. um, and, and to, to facilitate the kind of inf- the, the, the relationship where we can develop that right. trust. The other thing I always say to my clients is you don't want to take my word for this. You want to run everything I'm saying through your intuitive heart. That's the licensure here that you get to determine, does this work for me? Does this not? Is this yeah. helpful for me? Is this not? Um, and that you want to take it all with a grain of salt, but I'm not, I'm not looking to overcome your sense of doubt. We have to work with your sense of doubt. I, 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 I love that. I love that you're talking this and I think it's important for people to hear this because I think there's a big benefit in, in choosing someone to work with regardless of licensure or not, just depending on the connection and, and they, and the, it, that's what it really is. It's just the connection between two people and whether or not that person you're talking to is going to trigger an emotion that's going to spark a change in the positive way, right? You don't know who that that's is. Right. They could be licensed. They could be not licensed. It doesn't make a difference. You could be your mother, right? It, right. it doesn't matter, right? It matters. So do you have, for your initial, do you have a sit down? Is it like, let's just get to know one another? Let's not, like, what does that process look like for you? I know that we're, because this can go in a million different directions, but I'm really curious, and I think it's important for people to hear this, that you don't need a licensed professional to work with you to create change in your life. Mm. So I really want to give people that understanding of what that looks like snaps okay cool um what it looks like what's that process look like with you and yeah. for you uh well there's an intake form so i'm i'm assessing for who has had therapy who hasn't who's familiar with this conversation and who is this going to be new to um that doesn't mean that i'm saying no to someone who has not experienced therapy but it does mean i'm, I'm tagging them as someone that i'm going to have to do a little bit of therapeutic foundational work potentially um i'm also assessing to see are there are there active diagnoses right now? Is that do I need to refer this person out to therapy? Is this someone who's more appropriate for a therapeutic conversation? And in the consultation, what I'm looking to get a sense of is how realistic is this person's expectation? Mm. Um, and how how are they with hearing, hey, I, I need you to know I can't promise that. Um, and that's not mm-hmm. because I'm not an effective coach. That's because what you're asking for might not actually be what you need. When we get you liberated, when we get you freed up, when we get you a little more suspicious of some of your patterns, you might discover that this thing that you're introducing that's going to be the solution to your self-worth issue might not be necessary because we'll take care of the self-worth issue. So uh, what what someone is asking me to do, I'm not interested in promising because I, I don't want to be beholden to your treatment plan. I want to come up with my own perspective here of what we're going to do. And I, so I'm not so much looking for who am I coaching and is this a person uh, that's going to be affected by coaching. And I'm looking more at, is this a relationship that's going to work? Right. How do you distinguish whether someone is appropriate for coaching versus someone who's appropriate for a clinical therapist? Well, some of that is about 
Oh, but for a lot of factors, um, I want to make sure that I'm not working with someone who has an active eating disorder, an active addiction, active alcoholism, or you know, active uh, self-destructive tendencies where we have to go and do some triage. If they need that triage work, they need a, a different kind of coach. They need a recovery coach. They need a program. They need a, a whole other series of conversations. Um, what I'm generally looking for is, uh, does someone have a degree of familiarity with the thoughts that are happening in their head? And when I'm speaking to someone, it's really clear, is this person believing everything they think? Or is this someone who's able to assess, okay, here um, I'm believing these thoughts, but these thoughts are, are hurtful and difficult and, and create my choices for me. Hmm. Um, and they may not have that awareness, but at the very least, can you see that there are some choices you're making that are not happening with your permission? And if they're open to that, if they're able to see that, usually there's something fruitful to, to do in that work. I love that. Are there choices you're making that you are not giving per yourself permission to make. That's really well. More than, are, are there choices that you're making without your permission? Without your permission, I love that. Huh, that's, uh, that ties into our conversation yesterday about thoughts and thinking and recognizing where those thoughts are going. What are the benefits of no bullshit talk? Mm. Oh, great question. Because <laughs> sometimes people are so. <laughs> Right. Like we live in this time right now of it's all strange, in my opinion. There's some strange things happening and there's some really positive <laughs> things happening. Uh, uh, like I'm someone that is so hypersensitive and mm -hmm. also I thrive in no bullshit. Right. I thrive. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a 12 step culture where my bullshit was called out constantly. And it's the reason my life was saved. Right. Mm hmm. And also that could be really detrimental to some people, sure. right? If you're not in control of your stress responses, if you grew up with parents who were very overly critical in a shame-based family, right? So it's it's mm -hmm. like this, it's hard, it's just, it's hard to distinguish what's right for one person may not be right for another. But I back to what you said, I was like, what is no bullshit? Is that what you said? For well, me. What, what, what's the benefit of no bullshit talk? Right. Right, right. For me, when I think of no bullshit, what I'm really going for is uh, authenticity. How could I show up without micromanaging it or trying to seem more professional or trying to seem more useful or trying to seem more intelligent? I'm done with the trying to seem more anything. Um, and, and I think what people relate to is being willing to show up as exactly as we are and risking trusting that that's fucking enough. Yeah. We amen. don't have to market this to the end of the earth and what? <laughs> no, amen. Amen. I, I, I have a question around that specifically because yeah. therapists are taught not to self-disclose, right? Mm -hmm. And it was actually Lori Cohen who works at Interactions. Oh, I know Lori. Yeah. Please tell Lori I said hello. She's the yeah. best. And she helped me so much with my work with clients when she gave me permission to self-disclose when it's in benefit of the client. Because I was right. always taught, you don't self-disclose. You don't personally talk about yourself. And right. yet, when I did my 12-step work with people and I was being mentored by a, you know someone in the 12 steps, when they self-disclosed, I felt a feeling of relief. And then I had a therapist who never self-disclosed. And I'm like, am I in a room with a serial killer? I don't know anything about this mm -hmm. person. And I remember there was a client once that died and I just found out right? This client overdose and I just found out and I was sobbing and I had to go into group. And I'm like, fuck, like I have to take away my humanity for a second. And I was told, no, go in there and show them your tears. Show them that you're a human being and how do you walk through this loss, right? So what do you think about self-disclosure as a therapist and as a coach? Well, I think there's some therapists who do self-disclosure gracefully really gracefully. In fact, the best therapists I, I, I've had and the best therapists that are my colleagues are those that really artfully find a way to do that. Um, and so I, I didn't leave therapy because there was no room to do that. I left therapy because I didn't want to worry about, is this okay or is this not? I wanted to be able to share where I felt was appropriate, but I didn't want to worry about, does the BBS think it was appropriate to share that? <laughs> yeah. So um, I think there are plenty of therapists who self-disclose in a very appropriate way. I just didn't want to deal with the, for me, that noise was not helpful. Um, but I think we know each other by our shame. 
We don't know each other by our successes. We don't connect by, oh, you had that success. Fantastic. I did too. That doesn't make us feel more connected. Your heart's broken. My heart's broken. Then we feel connected. Mm -hmm. So I think being able to, to show, to share that is immensely healing. I also think that we, we have to do the job of taking the, the folks who are facilitating the healing conversation. Let's take them off the pedestal. We are human beings helping other human beings. And it does not help you being my client to have me on a pedestal with some expectation of how I function and operate perfectly outside mm -hmm. of these conversations. Um, I want to be accountable for what I'm working on. Now, I am not sharing a current meltdown with a client. I'm obviously sharing things that I've, I've worked through enough that it's not fresh. This is not a wound that I'm then dumping into our session. But I think there is room to say, boy, I've struggled with this too. Here's what it looked like. Here's what was helpful for me. Or here's where I'm noticing this coming up in my own life. Here's where I'm trying to practice with it. I relate to this. This is a common issue. This won't go away. Let's expect to keep working with this. Um, here's how I'm continuing to work with this. Mm. And I think that does the, I think that works at twofold. I think that humanizes me as a clinician. Um, and I think it also, it, it's a lifeline of humanity to the client. Uh, and I think we need more of those wherever we can find them. Well, I, I, I take a look back at like, sorry, here you go. Um, the, a lot of the life changing or life opening, eye opening moments that I've had have come in places where it's either with my, my partner or my wife or my friends. And so when I talk to my, my partner or my friends, I don't expect them to give the, give me big words that I don't understand. I don't expect them to write it down on a piece of paper or jot it down or write an essay about it or whatever. They, I just expect them to sit there, listen to me, complain about the same crap that they that they're going through that relates to it. And and there's a thing to say that the best therapists are the people that are you know your. your, your Technically, your friends or people that were, you know, that are very close to you potentially, because there's no, there's no ulterior motive beside trying to help and trying to relate and trying to create something. So now, if you add on expertise and professionalism, such as a life coach or you know a therapist, ideally you want to create the same kind of an environment that your friends can create for you, but with a professional background, right? So if a coach can be like a friend and call you out on your bullshit and create a sense of relationship, but also has the expertise and professionalism to help you, that's like the perfect scenario. Because a lot of times friends can also take it in a different direction. They can make it, make it about themselves. They don't really know how to guide you. They can open you up and not know how to close it, right? So now if you bring in that professionalism and expertise, it's best of both worlds, right? That's what I, yeah, so it certainly I, helps. That, that, that's, I like that, uh, and I think that's a huge piece to it. I have a question for you, though. Do you advertise your history of licensure and education as part of your quote-unquote pitch? You know, I, I didn't used to, or rather, no, sorry. When I started off, I, I, I did just because I wanted to uh, clarify, look, I, I have some credibility here. I know what I'm talking about. I was coming out of the treatment world, so most of my referrals were coming from therapists and things like that anyway. Um, and then for a period, I had dropped it. But my, uh, I, I don't know if this is even an answer to your question. Um, recently, the, my project manager who helps with some of my social media, uh, because there has been a bit of an uptick in um, holding the wellness industry accountable, um, in the way that media is, uh, is scrutinizing the wellness industry and, and, uh, influencers in the wellness industry. Right, and right. do we really know what we're talking about, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she had added parentheses, former therapist <laughs> after my name on, on the Instagram. And I think it references it a little bit in the, uh, um, on the website, but that's less about marketing it and more about just saying, this is, this is an exception. <laughs> There's right. an exception here. Speaking of holding, the wellness community accountable. What is your opinion on the uprise of using psychedelics as a form of treatment? Do you have any opinion on that? Yeah. Um, I, and who, I and who have, coordinates that care? I have lots of opinions, lots of thoughts on that. Um, I, I think in terms of drugs in general, I think psychedelics in a lot of plant medicine got put into uh, the category along with the rest of 
the really intense, dangerous drugs that we have difficult relationships with. Uh, and I think it's easy to have a difficult relationship with a psychedelic, too. I think there's certainly people who can abuse them. But overall, I think these are uh, important, underrated tools. And some people can have experiences uh, recreationally that create therapeutic benefits, but I generally don't recommend that. <laughs> Um, and I know the people that I know that have had success did it in a, uh, and by success, I mean, um, it yielded the results that they were hoping for from the journey. They worked with professionals in therapeutic environments. Do you think that legalizing psilocybin will hinder someone's, how do, how do we say that? Like, there's some people that think that if you legalize some of these psychedelics, it will be a big harm to society uh, because then there's no way of regulating it and anyone can just go use psilocybin or any other type of plant medicine and then go drive a car, right? But they could do that now, right? But Yeah, I mean, they're not even supposed to do that with alcohol and they do that with alcohol anyway. So um, there are also not lethal doses of psilocybin. That's also not, that's not possible to do. You can have a really gnarly journey. You can have a gnarly journey and make some very questionable life decisions while you're doing it. But um, the dosage itself is is not going to knock you out. Generally speaking, my sense is that there's more good than harm here. Um, I, I think I think yeah. that there is a lot. There is definitely a lot of good than harm, dependent on who is administrating it, the surrounding, and the setting. Right? I think it has to come with somebody who's educated and understands it. it can't just be like some random person that did it a couple of times and like and is now a journeyman or a shaman or whatever it is and and self-proclaimed self -proclaimed. shaman yes yeah, lots of right but i mean but, but, but that ties in with life coaching too because there's a lot of self-proclaimed life coaches that's kind of mm -hmm. why i brought it up because it's in the same realm yeah i mean there's a lot of self-proclamation even with social media personalities that they have no business becoming wellness coaches and but they are because they decided to work out every day for five days a week for the past 10 years and now all of a sudden there are they can tell you about diets and, and exercise yeah, they know something about mental health too. And they they uh, understand so, how right. mental health ties into your exercise. So there's a lot of that, and that and this that's just wellness. There's financial markets. That's it's the same thing. So I mean, I think social media in general has created outlets for just people in general to be self-proclaimed anything. Once you start bringing in psilocybin, you start bringing in psychedelics, plant-based medicines. I think now you're playing with a little bit something a bit more dangerous, uh, because it, if 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 misused, it can go in the wrong direction. I, uh, what does misused mean to you? Just so I'm, I'm understanding what you, you're. I think it's with false intentions and hopes of you're luring people in for certain uh, outcomes or journeys, and they're they're trusting you based off of what you're advertising, and then they get a completely different experience because you lack the experience beyond what you've personally have had. Right, so this I see. So you're talking about targeting wellness influencers who are marketing a particular result from taking psilocybin. Yeah, like you're going to be able to deal with your trauma. Your trauma will go away, right? Or you'll be able to process through things that you never even dreamed that you were even issues for you. Mm -hmm. Like, and and that's based off of yeah, maybe their personal experience that they've had. But now they're taking that and creating group settings, environments, opening up psilocybin churches. Um, <laughs> I'm not, it's not a joke. It's real. It's an actual thing. No, no, thing. no. I, I, I'm nodding. I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I understand. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but that's dangerous because you're not looking at it unbiasedly. You're looking at it from your own personal window. And, and, yeah. and that's where I have the issue that if you start legalizing it, there, you're right. There is no regulation. There's no control. There's no structure to that. And yet, old shamans were considered the psychologists of the time. And there was no like, technical rules and, rules and regulations and license licensing and sure but it was it was it was finite it was very small pool it wasn't like there was thousands of shamans out there and every other person became a shaman like it was a very small pool it was very underground very like you needed to know to get now if you create a scenario where you can walk into your local 7-eleven and buy it like it's anybody can do it. Yeah, I think it's so dangerous. It's like the same thing with becoming a life coach, right? There are people that are taking two week life course, life coaching certification programs, and now there are proclaimed life coach working with people. And then there are people that are using psychedelics off one time with yeah a, a facilitator, and oh, I, I've done it one time, so I'm going to go help people with their trauma. 
Right. And that's, all the time. and that's dangerous. And yeah. I think so. Yeah. And I, I think that's some, certainly some irresponsible work, but I don't know that that means that the substance itself no. needs to be illegal because people are being irresponsible about how they're marketing their ability to facilitate it. Where I do see it being um, potentially dangerous, at, first of all, those that have any sort of history of psychosis in the family, obviously there's a tendency um, to spark schizophrenia, or if you have a tendency towards schizophrenia in your own behavior, often this can that can um, spark a relapse into that behavior. But uh, so that's problematic, obviously. The other issue is is people turning to this as um, as the go to tool repeatedly. And the, mm. the great uh, Buddhist Zen Buddhist philosopher, also alcoholic, uh, Alan Watts says uh, about psychedelics specifically, when you get the message, like when you get the healing, when you get the point of the journey, hang up the phone, right. you don't need to keep picking this up, you don't need to keep referencing this. Um, so while I, while I totally appreciate that, yeah, of course we want to be using this stuff responsibly in a trained setting with a trained person in an appropriate set and setting. Um, I don't know that I, I agree with your take that the substance itself is dangerous. No, not, not yet. And the problem when you legalize is you give big corporations opportunities to manipulate. It, it, wait, you, wait, you think they're not, you think the manipulation isn't happening now? Not to the like, look at marijuana, where it was before legalization and where it is now, and the potency and what's happening to kids that are smoking. I'm not saying that I'm not at this at the level that it's at right now. I agree. It's the when you can go buy it from a local un person that you have to find their number or like somebody's got to know somebody to get it or a chocolate or whatever. It's not. But that's because there, it, it massive marketing and money hasn't been pushed into it. Look at again, perfect example is marijuana. Where marijuana was and where it is now, and the what you can get with marijuana in what forms and in, in which, you know how you know outlets, how it can be packaged, all of these things has changed dramatically since Absolutely it was legalized. It has. Since Absolutely it was legalized. It has. And we also can't deny that the, the the shift in the the tendency to uh, the opioid epidemic has been impacted positively here oh, by the legalization of marijuana. So 100%. I'm, well, I, I don't disagree. Yeah, there are concerns that are coming up. Um, but I think some of these are just just the necessary fluctuation of a society trying to figure out how do we adapt to what we're learning? So we understand, OK, marijuana can be used as medicine. It can also be used as a, sedo a sedative, dissociative uh, device that separates us from things. How do we regulate it accordingly, or how do we how do we shift our relationship to it as a society, recognizing that this can be beneficial and dangerous, like anything else, though. Like ice cream can also be beneficial and dangerous, depending on our relationship. Yeah, one hundred percent. I I think if you ask enough people that have been living in the world of psilocybin, they actually are against legalization. They don't mm -hmm. want to get it legalized. They like it the way that it is. But that's besides the point. That's a whole different topic. I do want to ask you, though, based off of regulation structure, do you feel that life coaching needs more structure and more guidance? Maybe not like a BBS, but where there is a formal training process, something that beyond two weeks, um, something that there is a lack thereof now that it, it's eventually getting to that because it's becoming more and more uh, popular? Well, I think that's why the the certification programs are popping up is to try and right. speak to that that need and to try and answer that. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll say from having work, I, I end up doing a lot of supervision with coaches and training coaches and developing coaches and things like that. Um, and, and those that have come from certified programs don't seem to to be markedly more experienced or markedly more knowledgeable um, than those that are perhaps coming with their own life experience or their own research. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and that this is just my two cents. So please take this with grains of salt. Um, so it, do I think it could be improved and, and it could probably use a sort of overseeing board? Yeah, I think that could be helpful. But I think there's something also to um, normalizing humans helping humans. And I don't know that an oversight board always facilitates that. Right. Uh, and it, it's usually more about money than service anyway. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it goes back to like, we don't really, we shouldn't really need attorneys, right? But we do because 
you know, we're a society that likes, you know, to legally protect ourselves or whatever. But technically, <laughs> we should just handshake it out and walk away, right? But that's not sure. that usually the case. Um, I think that it's, it's it, and the reason why laws exist is because somebody was affected by something negative, negatively in a negative way, and there was nobody to protect that individual. And there was no, there was no recourse for that situation. So it's very similar to like influencers who are promoting certain things who have no background in promoting. But yeah, it's mm -hmm. human to human, but then there are millions of people that could potentially be harmed because of this promotion, right? And mm -hmm. so, so there's always a, there's a give and take. I agree with you 100%. I think that the more regulation and structure kind of takes that away, that, that no bullshit philosophy and like directness. But then, you know, you also have on the other hand, people to get harmed because there isn't anything like that. Sure, yeah. Well, I think that's what's important about this podcast too, is we're not saying one way is bad or the other. It's just, I think like with anything that's the benefit of podcasts, the more information one has, the more that they can make a choice that's best for themselves. There have been times where, I mean, I've been in, I've had a therapist since I was 13. There are times where I work with a therapist and then there are times where I work with a coach on certain areas. And I think mm -hmm. one has its value. And I was always taught, and tell me your opinion on this, that a coach is more goal oriented than a therapist. I think some can be. I don't actually believe in goals. I think, mm. you know, goals are a way of micromanaging ourselves into doing the shit we didn't really want to do in the first place. Like I don't have to set a goal for myself to get up and write or coach. I, I can't stop doing those things. Um, so I think it's more about getting someone into alignment with what they're authentically interested in doing, what they're hungry to do, what they can't fucking stop doing. I think that's more to me. That's how I see the work. Um, but I think there's some people that we categorize it as as goal setting. So you would say that there's no like end line here. There's no like goalpost that we have to go through or score or whatever, right? Like it's constantly moving. It's constantly changing. There's no like finite. This is our goal. That's it. Once we finish this, we're we're done. I think some coaches work that way. That's not that's not the conversation I'm interested in having. Nice. Okay. So how do you set up your conversations right. with people that call you and oh. are saying and you, and they go, "Hey, I really want to work with you, Molly, and I want to work with you on my on my workaholism because you you made this post and I rewrote it because I loved it so much, right? You said <laughs> I'm so glad. You made a post on your Instagram that says Trauma and chronic stress responses that are capitalist society rewards, extreme independence, workaholism, compulsive exercise, chronic fear that you're falling behind, skipping meals, living on four, house, four houses, <laughs> living on four hours of sleep <laughs> and never asking for help, as well as the robo robust victim narrative, right? So if mm -hmm. someone comes to you and, they're sa and they say, hey, I'm really struggling with workaholism and balancing my work life and my family, mm -hmm. where do you mm -hmm. go with that? Yeah, great question. Sure. No, it's like, yeah. Um, the first thing I'm interested in is where is the noise? Like, is it about I'm not doing enough family stuff or I'm doing too much work stuff? And, how, you know, how, how is this actually manifesting for you? That's what I want to get a read on. Um, because often what someone is presenting as the problem might be a, a an offshoot of a larger problem. So if it's workaholism and uh, you know, work life balance, I'm interested in the self worth issue that keeps us going into work and keeps us repeatedly putting the nose to the grindstone um, to try and solve a self-worth issue? Or is this more about avoidance of the family and there's a relationship issue here that's keeping you from diving in? And that, that's just off the top of my head. This is not to say that everybody falls into those categories. But the question I'm always asking my clients is where is the noise? What area of your life? Where is it showing up? And what the fuck is the noise? What, do, what are you believing? What are you hearing? What's the narrative that's going on in your head? And noise is the commentary that's driven by shame and fear. So a thought like, what's for lunch, probably isn't noise. I mean, if you have an eating disorder, it might be noise. Um, but a, a, a noise might be like, oh, this isn't going to go wrong. Or Molly, you, you better sound smart on this podcast. Or this better be as good as I hope it is. Or man, I should have done, I should have done, stayed longer at work. Whatever the noise happens to be, it's driven clearly by shame and fear. And we want to get more suspicious about that, that particular narrative and what's going on there, because usually we're listening to that like it's entirely credible. Well, if someone came in and said, I'm a workaholic, my workaholism is negatively affecting my family. By the end of mm -hmm. my work with you, I don't want to be a workaholic. What if that's their, that's how they're measuring their work with you? What would you Great. say to that? 
yeah, they, they get to do that. They get to track how's the workaholism going. And it's not a conversation I'm wanting to avoid there, of course. And, I, and I want to be asking them, like, it, how's this going? Is this affecting what you want it to affect? Is this doing what you want it to do? Um, and some clients will say, like, yeah, this is totally solving what I wanted it to solve. Um, others will say, yeah, it didn't solve what I thought I wanted to solve, but it solved these other things that I really did need to take care of. And I just didn't know that. And um, either now this is a non-issue to begin with, or now we can go back and, and, and address that. So it's not that I'm dismissing that what they're addressing as something they want to work on as the issue. Um, but I am, I'm looking at the, the whole narrative. So if we're just focusing on work, I'm missing a number of other elements here that are irrigating your relationship with work. Mm. Is this dealing with your question? I feel like I'm not quite. No, absolutely. I I, I pause because I I really like to just digest what you're saying, and I agree. That's how I that's how I work with people as well. I guess I I was really you're the first person I've ever heard to say I don't really do like goal setting, and so I really mm -hmm. want to understand that because I find that to be very interesting, and I want to understand your approach on that and why well, what i'll ask a client yeah. is like how would you know if this work was working mm -hmm. how would you know that we were doing what we wanted to and usually what they end up describing is not a set of circumstances oh i'd be home more and working less they describe how they'd be feeling mm -hmm. and that's a pretty good indication for where we want to go into and that they have the the um their relief hooked up to a particular set of circumstances a result and i'm seeing their relief has more to do with their relationship to all of these circumstances. I love and that. that. We, that's, that's what transformation is. We always think transformation is when the circumstance change. No, transformation is when our relationship to the circumstance mm. changes. And because that's changed, then the circumstance starts to shit. That's what's fucking magical about yeah, it. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. No, that's very true. How, uh, do you set up like measuring tools? Is there check-ins? Like, how, how, like what, is, what does the process look like with somebody who's working with you like long-term? A lot like therapy, okay. a lot like therapy, where they're meeting weekly or every other week where they're involved in some of my groups simultaneously. Is this something like, where you're also available kind of an on-call thing? Is it, is it very much like a, like a, like you scheduled slot is this and that's it? Yep. That's yep. We meet, uh, we have a 50 minute conversation. <laughs> that's right. Um, and sometimes if I'm doing a, a, a coaching container or if there are coaches that I'm doing supervision with, they can shoot me emails or texts and ask about clients or, or situations and things like that. I'm curious, in your transition, the first client you had as a coach, what mm -hmm. was that like? Oh, terrifying. Just <laughs> terrifying. Uh, uh, talk um, about also that. exciting, but, yeah. but, but mostly in the I'm really, I'm really curious. Like when you knew the shackles were removed mm -hmm. and you had the ability just to fucking go anywhere, what was that like Boy, for you? The terror was, here I am without the shackles. What if I'm not effective? Ooh. What if I'm not effective even when I'm freed up? And that's where my coach was like, oh, you need this. You need to be effective as a coach. You shouldn't do this work. If you need to be effective, <laughs> let's let's get out of the game right now. And I was like, oh, right. This has nothing to do with, am I going to be able to change someone's life? This has to do with like, do I feel inspired in the conversation? Do Am I discovering something? Am I on fire in this? And what I tend to find is, if I'm enjoying the conversation, if I'm bringing everything I have, all my consciousness, all my scrutiny, all my discernment to that conversation in a really playful way, they tend to see the results. Just be you. Apparently. It's, <laughs> like, that, it's, it's so difficult. Was there? It's really hard. Uh, it is. We're trained out of that. I know. Um, did you find that there was a difference in your approach when as a therapist, you were trained to look for a clinical diagnosis versus a coach, you're not. One of the things, one of the reasons I think my coach was telling me, Molly, are you done pretending to be a therapist? Is that diagnostics were not my jam. <laughs> it was one of the many reasons that, that he, he was saying that to me. Um, but that I always found when I was doing supervision with, uh, to get my hours for, to be a therapist, um, that when I was asked diagnostic questions, I was like, I, I feel like you're speaking Greek to me because I'm, I was just never looking through that lens ever, ever, ever. Um, it, it still doesn't come organically to me now. Uh, so I, I, I just, I leave that to the therapist. I leave that to the other clinicians. So no, that was not a hard pivot for me. That was a delightful pivot. Yeah, I, I, 
I, I've run into people that have, um, like a friend of mine who's a realtor, he has multiple coaches. Mm-hmm. He has a coach for this, a coach for that, a coach to how to buy groceries. Like, <laughs> ah, this, this is very a, compartmentalized for a, him. Huh? a coach for everything. Mm-hmm. Is there a benefit to having multiple coaches? So uh, there's, it's a two-part question, okay? First part, what are the benefits of a coach having a coach? Like or like a therapist having a therapist. I, I know, I know, I know your answer. More, I know, I know, I know, I, so I know, sorry. I know where you're going with this, and I agree with you. Uh, the benefits of a coach having a coach, number one, and then the second part to the question: Are there benefits of an individual having multiple coaches for different aspects of their life? Is it better to have one? Is it better to have a couple? What's the perfect design? Because again, coaches are, you know, it's there's a coach for wellness, there's a coach for finance, there's a coach for this, there's a coach for that. I think ultimately they're all dealing with the same issue. Um, the core issues is different aspects, but that's just my opinion. I'm not a professional um, coach. But, um, you know, so if you can answer that and two different questions. I think the the oversight and accountability is essential. Like a coach having a coach or a therapist having a therapist, boy, if you're not taking your shit to someone and laying it out and going, oh, what sense do we make of all this? Um, I think we're missing a serious opportunity for growth. And, and you're, you're also undercutting your clients who need you to have some space to have that conversation and need someone to, for you to be reflecting with someone else's eyes on what's going on. I think that's always helpful. Um, should should that be like a yeah. question that a client has for the coach? Like do absolutely, you... I, this is one of, one of the things I say all the time. If you're interviewing a coach, ask if they have supervision. Ask if they work with a mentor. Nice. Ask if someone oversees their cases. Uh. You want to know about that? Yeah, yeah. I think there's a huge benefit to that. I agree, hundred percent. Totally. Yeah. Um, you know, and in terms of your second question, look, generally speaking, if someone is interesting to you and you want to pursue that that conversation to see what wisdom do you have for me. I don't have any problem with that. I think it's it, it fine to to tap into some coaching conversations um, and get you know, maybe the benefit of what what's the financial expert or do you want to do a fitness thing? What, what do they know? That's helpful, potentially. But really, I think we should be pretty discerning about the people we are taking our big life conversations to. Um, and it can be dangerous to ask your 10 top coaches uh, what they think you should do about a particular circumstance, because at some point we're just outsourcing our own authority. And what you want out of coaches are people who are going to endorse your internal authority, not make you dependent on their outside of their authority. Then you just have to keep returning to them. Right. Um, so I think if your coach is helping you, helping you align within yourself, helping you trust your own instinct and your own intuition and your own critical thinking, um, if, if that's helpful for you, stick with that coach. I, I don't, I, I have some hesitation about the people who want to gather a bunch of coaches um, only because I, I think there's only so uh, so much vulnerability we can bring right. to a conversation with someone new. So I'm generally in favor of, of people working with one or two, like a coach and a therapist. That's the greatest team I can imagine for someone. Um, and if you want to do a little a la carte questioning of other coaches who have particular specializations, that might be helpful. But I wouldn't encourage that as your primary relationship. Yeah, because I can also see a lot of conflict between the, totally. the various coaches. And it's not like there's case management or case conferencing between the coaches. So, Well, th- there should be. There certainly right. should be. I, I do if that with if the, that the is coaches happening. therapists that are. Right. It, yeah, yeah, that's true. When people sign up to work with you, is there usually a time limit? Is there usually packages? Is there usually an allotted amount of time that you do work with a client? Most of the clients that I have, uh, that I have, uh, have been long-term clients and continue to work with them. And, um, sometimes people are, I, again, they'll do like a year of once a week or then drop down to once every other week. And sometimes they'll take a break from individual sessions entirely and just do groups for a year. Um, there are all sorts of ways that people do it. Sometimes people will, will just do a bunch of check-in sessions once a month, uh, and just the group work. Lots of different uh, ways that people work with that. When I'm working with new clients, I ask that they commit to six sessions up front just to give us some runway and to make sure that I'm not saying yes to too many clients at once. Um, and yeah, the, the, there's no there's no time limit. There's no time frame. How has your relationship to your clients changed when we started doing more 
coaching sessions via Zoom versus in person? Yeah, great question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I found, I, I, I don't yet know, I'll say this, I don't yet know how my coaching has been impacted because I haven't gone back to in person fully. The two times that I've seen, I've had clients who flew me in for particular um, events, like we did day long intensives with them. And so the two clients that I've worked with in person <laughs> since the pandemic, it felt like working in 3D. I felt like, oh my God, I have a, a massive information coming at me way more than I ever do on Zoom. So what that has made me think is, I, I bet I've gotten a little bit reductive in my coaching. I bet I have started um, overlaying some templates and uh, and moving a little bit more quickly because I'm not getting as much information as like you know the foot tapping or so the shift of someone's body that I don't get to see in the same way. Um, hmm. All in all, I like to think that the the caliber of conversation is the same. I get the feedback from clients like, "Oh, you translate through the screen," and that's great, fantastic. I'm uh, I'm glad I'm glad that works. But I do feel like something is really missing from um, from being in person. I have a follow up question to the Zoom aspect. So you know we're, we're we're fortunate to live in LA where there's millions of different cultures and different people from all over the all over the world. <clears throat> As a clinician, by state law, you can only perform within the state that you operate, right? There are some states mm -hmm, where you can get mm -hmm. a license, you know, across state lines, whatever. But commonly, most of the time, you're working with somebody that's from the state of California. What mm -hmm. does that bring? It brings a certain culture, ideology, way of thinking, way of living, whatever, all combined into one. Now, as a life coach, who has mm -hmm. the ability to Zoom as a norm, mm -hmm. and you can access somebody in, let's say, Alabama, or New Zealand, or wherever, anywhere in the globe. Mm -hmm. Your license is not restricting you anymore to the state that you're operating in. How is mm -hmm. that felt? I mean, I don't know if you have those types of clients or not, or what? Yeah, like, yeah I have clients in, in Germany and Australia and the UK okay, and, so, and in, in other states, yeah. So, because now you have people from Germany who have a completely different mindset than, yeah. let's say, people from California and different mm -hmm. culture, different background, different way. How exciting has that been for you? And what has that experience been like in that transition? Really curious. Totally enriching. I mean, not only are we dealing with me, I'm a very fast talker. So me having to slow the hell down so that they're not translating so fast has been just a good experience for for me. Um, that's been really helpful. Right. Um, and uh, they're, uh, everyone that I've, I've worked with has been really um, just, uh, I, I've, I've learned a tremendous amount. So even, even when I'm working with this particular couple and thinking of um, conversations that I would give them to have with each other, which I'm, I'm, to me would be fundamental baseline conversations for a couple to have, I was realizing from a cultural perspective, oh, these aren't conversations they've ever touched at all. Mm -hmm. So I can't introduce this as like, oh, here's a baseline conversation when in fact we need a whole like, intimacy 101 conversation. Um, and the more clients that I've, I've worked with were German, I'm getting a sense of, oh, this is, this is a cultural phenomenon. I actually have to back this up. So there are definitely shifts in the process. Um, but I, I love working with people who are not all from California and I've, now we're located in, in Portland, Oregon. Oh, nice. Um, so you know, just get to work with people from all over, and it's a it's a luxury. It really is. It I feel like it's if extremely stimulating. Sorry. I, I'm so sorry. I, I'm looking at the time. I have to go into another oh. session right yes. now. I apologize. No problem at all. I'm so sorry. Go ahead if you have to come on. Thank you so much for coming on here. Uh, I I don't know if you have to go like this second. So this second, I, I do. Forgive okay, me. Go I, ahead. I, I it's all good. Guys. I so appreciate you guys. Thank you, Molly. We'll have you on Thank again. You. Yes. yes. And I did you, see you at the park. That's where I met you. We did have a the circle. Park. We had a park session with Rosewood. They put on an event together. Cloverfield. And at you and I and you and I talked about Lori. Yes. Oh. There we go. There okay. We go. All right. Gotcha. Bye, Molly. Much Thank love. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Take care. My pleasure. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you everyone for listening to this wonderful episode on Got Mental Health with Molly. We really appreciate your time. We appreciate your feedback. If you don't already, please rate, review, and follow us on all podcast platforms. Please give us your feedback. We love engaging with you. Follow us on TikTok and Instagram. And that's about it, folks. That's all she wrote. That's all Thanks, she wrote. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks. <laughs>